It is November 9th and this is The National. We begin tonight with alarming new information about a public health crisis and one potential and controversial solution. Every time fentanyl makes headlines, it's tempting to think that the crisis has hit a peak, that with enough awareness and resources, we can turn the corner. Then comes another dose of reality. And tonight we have new numbers on fentanyl's toll from British Columbia, and they are crushing. From the beginning of the year to September, 914 people have died in B.C. alone from fentanyl. That's more than double, a 140% increase over the same period last year. Three people a day. And this is despite a sweeping response. We have uh, put in more resources, as have provincial governments across the country. Uh, but this scourge is, uh, is sweeping across the world. That is the federal safety minister reacting to today's numbers from B.C., suggesting the struggle has just begun. British Columbia was the first province in the country to declare it a public health emergency. Since then, B.C. has committed hundreds of millions for the fight, allowing more supervised injection sites. I went to one last month. The volunteers working to keep addicts alive. No one has died at any of the sites. British Columbia has purchased tens of thousands of doses of naloxone, which reverses the effects of an OD. It's even available over-the-counter at pharmacies, but still the death toll skyrockets. Clearly those and other measures in the province aren't enough. People are using alone and they are dying alone. Tonight we want to tell you the story of one of them, 21-year-old Tristan Croker. His death has pushed his mother and some of her friends to demand something they consider life-saving. A drastic measure that some of you may feel is going too far. 22 years ago, I gave birth to Tristan, and today I buried his ashes under this tree. You know, every day people are dying, and families are being broken, and this is how birthdays are being celebrated, right? It's like, this is my son's birthday party. This is it. By the time Tristan was a teenager, cocaine had taken over his life. His mother, Kathy Wagner, tried desperately to help him, even taking Tristan to China when he was 16 to pursue his passion, Kung Fu, and to get him away from drugs. For a while, it worked. But just 10 weeks ago, Tristan relapsed. He used cocaine that was laced with fentanyl, and it killed him. The coroner's office says in more than 80% of street drug deaths in British Columbia, those drugs contain fentanyl. Many people out there are deliberately poisoning drug supplies. And they're poisoning drug supplies because it creates more addicts, creates more market, and is easier for them to transport. And they don't care about the number of the deaths along the way. These are some of the faces of the fentanyl crisis in BC, the boy next door or down the street. That's Tristan on the left, his friend Scott Gu and Ian Chalmers. Scott and Ian are still alive, but their parents worry for how long. So be everywhere oh, now. That's yeah. Yeah. I visited their mothers at a cabin on BC's Sunshine Coast near Vancouver. Their son's addictions have brought them together. I had based my everything on how he was doing. Luke Cameron's son Ian has struggled with cocaine and the risk of relapse. Here he is celebrating clean time at a recovery festival last year. Carrie, her neighbor, knows Lou's struggles well. She's here to offer her support. And then indeed more starts to emerge yeah. and it's... Deb Gu's children have substance abuse problems and she worries every day. I wish we were all better able to know our kids or anybody else at that deeper level when they're still alive. And then there's Kathy. She says Tristan understood the risks that his cocaine would likely contain fentanyl. And if there was no one there to help, an overdose would kill him. Why do you think it happened the way it did? It happened, I know why it happened the way it did. It's because he was ashamed, right? And I think, the, I think people, particularly in recovery, are so ashamed that they can't do it. They feel like it's a failure. They talk the talk. Why can't they walk the walk? And that's shameful to them. It knows no bounds. It can hit at any level, uh, any socioeconomic 
status, any neighborhood, anywhere, any age, any time. They came to Kathy's house. You know, and at your, the ser your son's service, Kathy, I'll never forget the moment that my son attended. And Kathy came across the room to hug Ian. And I stood there feeling a real mix of emotions, knowing that it could have been me at my son's service. There are many reasons people are using drugs alone, whether it's shame or not fully understanding the risks. These women feel there is one more step governments must take. The other big elephant in the room is the safety of the drug supply. And you know, it's, it, is, it is poison. Honestly, the only way that, that I think it's going to make a huge impact on that is to legalize and regulate drugs, and I know that that's not a popular stance right now. As we're talking today, four or five people are dying in British Columbia alone. How can we not care? How can we as humans not care about this story? I hope it never comes to your house. Cameron says there's nothing she can do to ensure her son doesn't relapse and risk death by using drugs alone. That's why she volunteers in Vancouver's downtown east side, where the fentanyl crisis first hit Canada. Getting almost good here? A tent and trailer run by volunteers who have the life-saving drug naloxone if there's an overdose. Hey, have a good day, eh? Though she worries so much about her son, being here gives her comfort. I know, sadly, that I can't save him. If I could, um, I would have saved him a decade ago. But what I can do is I can be down here and nobody dies when I'm here. And that's really empowering. Nobody dies on my shift here. Watching people using the same contaminated street drugs her son might use, with no one around to save him. For a lot of people, legalizing and regulating the drug supply may seem like a radical idea. Most politicians don't want to go anywhere near it. But today, BC's Minister of Mental Health was asked about whether a new approach was needed. Here's her response. I think it's time to have a conversation about that. I think we should be prepared as a country to have a courageous conversation about it. In the meantime, we are pushing the envelope and we are being bold and innovative and doing everything we can within the context of the present federal framework. Meanwhile, the city of Vancouver has essentially decriminalized possession of all drugs, including heroin and cocaine. A senior police officer told me they only arrest people in special circumstances, for example, if the drugs are near a school or a community center. In Calgary, police also say they generally don't arrest for possession, though they will confiscate the drugs. Ottawa police still make arrests, but officers use discretion there as well. But in Toronto, Montreal, Edmonton and Halifax, the police departments tell us it's still by the book. They enforce the laws against possession. All of those cities and others across Canada are struggling with their own fentanyl crises. And we've been digging into that story as well. Online, we have exclusive nationwide numbers on the crisis, including figures you may find shocking on the degree to which fentanyl contaminates other street drugs. We also take a close look at a pop-up supervised injection site here in Toronto. Go to cbcnews.ca slash the national. And Andrew, the provincial government in BC uh, saying that they're going to be making some uh, announcements tomorrow on this topic, so the story continues. Yeah, we'll be watching it. And just to give folks at home some insight into the Vancouver newsroom, I mean, we routinely ask ourselves the question, I wonder how many people will die of fentanyl this month, right? It's become this, this somber monthly ritual, checking the coroner's office for the, for the latest numbers. And without fail, those numbers keep going up. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there are new sexual misconduct allegations tonight against yet another celebrity. This time... It's comedian Louis C.K. Five women have come forward, telling the New York Times that he crossed the line. Among the allegations, that he masturbated in front of some of them. Louis C.K. is refusing to say anything about it, but already there have been consequences. Tonight's premiere of his new movie was abruptly cancelled just before the New York Times story came out. And cable network HBO says it's dropped him from an upcoming comedy benefit and is pulling his content from their on-demand service. Now, it's worth noting unsubstantiated rumors have been flying around all of this for years, but now with the allegations published, others are speaking out tonight about issues specifically in the comedy industry. 
has been going on since the beginning of time slash the beginning of comedy. And so, and most of these women didn't want to come forward because it goes against the culture. Um, if I had come forward and complained about these people, I would just, people would say, oh, who wants to work with her? She's a buzzkill. That's Canadian comedian Rebecca Kohler sharing her own experiences with sexual harassment in comedy. You'll hear my full interview with her later in the program. Meantime, another report that we're keeping an eye on tonight. Allegations of election meddling. But this time, it's Russian President Vladimir Putin accusing the United States of trying to interfere in his country's upcoming election. That's Putin in Russia today, speaking out after four of his country's skiers were found guilty of doping at the Sochi Olympics. He says the U.S. is making it all up as a way to derail next year's Russian election. And another story we're watching closely, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's trip to Vietnam. He'll be attending the APEX summit on Friday. But before that, in just a few hours, he'll meet with countries that are part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They'll continue talks on how to move forward after the U.S. withdrawal, but Trudeau is insisting he will not be rushed into signing on to new terms. The Prime Minister is in Asia with a lot on his plate, but many Canadians want to see how he deals with Aung San Suu Kyi. They're meeting just hours away now. She has been under fire for months for her country's treatment of Rohingya Muslims and for her tepid response. Nala Ayed looks at whether Canada has any influence. Nala. Rosemary, long before the current crisis erupted, concerns about the human rights of Rohingya have been raised with Aung San Suu Kyi. It was after former Secretary of State John Kerry brought it up last year that she said, rather starkly, that Myanmar needed space to deal with what is a very difficult and sensitive internal issue. All we are asking is that people should be aware of the difficulties that we are facing and to give us enough space to sort out our problems. Well, that was back in May 2016, before hundreds of thousands of Rohingya escaped a campaign of what many have described as ethnic cleansing, and which the UN, as well as survivors, blame on the Myanmar military, which we can't forget is still effectively running the country. In between, Suu Kyi and Myanmar have been given space on the issue. The U.S. lifted its sanctions last year, and despite complaints from human rights groups, it seems quiet diplomacy was, and still is, the preferred way to approach Myanmar on the Rohingya issue. The Prime Minister's envoy, Bob Bray, has just returned from a visit to Myanmar. I don't know whether it's fair to say she has all the space in the world or not. The issue of, uh, of the Rohingya has been a matter of dispute for a long time, and they have been increasingly marginalized, and those steps have, have not, frankly, been unpopular with the rest of the country. So she is going to need to move. The country does have to move in a way that will um, embrace diversity and pluralism. Easy to say, but the question is how. There's been a parade of world figures who have met her who thought they had sway. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres hoped a meeting back in May would open doors. Uh, issues of governance, of democracy, of human rights, and uh, how can. And Justin Trudeau also brought up the rights of Rohingya behind closed doors in Ottawa back in June. One hope for concrete action came from former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. At Suu Kyi's request, he led a year long commission with concrete recommendations on how to solve the Rohingya crisis. She accepted the recommendations, but there has still been little perceptible change. In fact, things have gotten worse. So when the violence started, we saw some tough talk from world leaders, including Guterres and Trudeau. Again, no perceptible change. And in no small part, some insist, including some Rohingya we spoke to in Bangladesh, because it's really the military in charge. So what can Justin Trudeau possibly accomplish tomorrow that others haven't? Well, I think we all have to keep trying. <clears throat> I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it's an ongoing uh, and persistent dialogue. Okay, so Nala, has Aung San Suu Kyi made any moves herself towards trying to reconcile or solve this crisis? Well, last week, Suu Kyi did visit the troubled Rakhine state for the first time since the crisis started. And diplomats are saying to us that the international message has been heard in Myanmar. The question is how it responds and how much more space it needs to do it. And, you know, we're talking about Justin Trudeau meeting her, but it, it, do we have any sense of what kind of impact that could have, any soft power that he might have there to try and influence her? 
Well, for one, it's going to be one of her first meetings, actually, with the Western head of state since the crisis started. So that perhaps gives it more weight than it normally would have. Activists, though, are hoping for something more concrete from Trudeau. One I spoke to here in London said he must pressure Suu Kyi to uh, commit again to implementing Kofi Annan's recommendations and to making it easier for Rohingya, who have left the country, to return. Okay. Rosemary. Nala, thanks for that. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Not surprising that many people are disappointed in Aung San Suu Kyi. After all, she's had a long way to fall because for decades, she's been held up as an icon of democratic struggle. That started in 1988 when she led anti-government protests. She had the pedigree. Her father was a hero of Burmese independence, so her activism worried military rulers. They shut down the protests, then shut Suu Kyi up, locking her under house arrest for about 20 years. But from behind her gate at home, the lady made her mark. Leader of the main opposition party, recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, honorary Canadian citizen, once freed, she seemed to justify all the praise, demanding reforms from the military, winning national elections, sharing power since then. But she, like her country, has a blind spot, an anti-Muslim bias. And it's exactly that which has some Canadians calling for the government to strip her of that honorary citizenship. Suu Kyi is one of six people to ever get it in the world. No one has lost it. While the Prime Minister meets with Suu Kyi, though, he's got some challenges here at home, including questions about Liberal fundraiser Stephen Bronfman and his ties to an offshore trust. The At Issue panel is back to break it all down for us. That's just ahead. New parents will soon be able to stay at home longer with more parental leave. The question is, can they really afford to? And we'll have a CBC News investigation into one of the biggest ticket resellers in the world. And he's Canadian. What is your relationship with StubHub? How much money are you making, Mr. Lavallee? How much money are you making off the tickets? News reporting is never a nine-to-five job. Newsmen are at work around the clock in a variety of locations. Reading reflector fit. Heat a bit. That's good. Now let me take a reading on your face. And that's four, that's four and a half. Fine. Two to one ratio. Face down. Face down and face up, eh? Yeah. So you want you want it uh, about 15, 20 seconds on you? And then, and then you want me to pass onto the harbor? Zoom. But it's not just a matter of standing in front of a film camera. A reporter has to research his story first, and it may take several hours to garner the facts for a report which will occupy less than 90 seconds of airtime. It looks like another record year for the Port of Montreal. Elevators are still moving last year's bumper wheat crop, and Expo provided heavy business in the first month of He must think of ways to illustrate his story, as in this case, through the use of silent film being shot simultaneously by another cameraman elsewhere in the harbor area. On the air, the two films will be married, so that the silent film illustrates what the reporter is talking about. I came to Chicago after being in Boston. And these days, the job of TV reporter isn't solely a man's domain. This girl was one of the first women TV reporters in Canada. She came to television via newspaper work and quickly found a niche doing interviews from a woman's angle. News can be a rough business, however, and a girl reporter must be equally adept at covering everything from a fashion show to a prison riot. It's in an interview such as this, however, that she can probably draw more information from her subject than a wide-eyed male counterpart ever would. What did you do before you decided to become a bunny? Well, oddly enough, I was a school teacher. I taught in a high school just outside of Boston in a little tiny town, taught speech, drama, and English. For uh, some number of new families, they're going to have a harder time making ends meet. So it's not really actual choice if you can't afford to avail yourself of the system. The system she's talking about, the government's new extended parental leave program. Starting next month, new parents will have the option to take 18 months instead of 12. It was a key promise in the Liberal 2015 election campaign. The question is, how many Canadian families will be able to take advantage? 
Extended benefits come into effect December 3rd. The catch, there is no additional money. Parents will be given the option of spreading the same EI benefits out over 18 months. The government says this is about flexibility. Anything that makes it easier for families to balance work and life is good for our economy, is good for our businesses. But critics say it's not really a choice for everyone. Instead of 55% of their monthly income, many parents would be receiving about 33%, making it unfeasible for a large number of Canadians. Again, unless you're in the sort of the higher earning brackets, if I can say that, the wealthier Canadians, the extra six, six months is not going to mean anything because you can't actually take it because you can't afford to take it. And parents-to-be have one more new option. Also starting next month, benefits can kick in up to 12 weeks before the baby is born instead of eight. Of course, many factors go into a parent's decision on extended leave income, just one part of the equation. So is it a real option for most Canadians? Here's Katie Simpson. You ready? Whee! Uh, what's life like as a new parent? <laughs> it's, it's never a dull moment. <laughs> Given the chance, new mom Daniela Holley would have loved to stay home for 18 months with her son Charlie. We are um, pretty um, frugal people, <laughs> so we can make it work. So this is Hannah. Uh, she was born on October 7th and uh, she's having a great nap right now. <laughs> Laura Griffin is also a first-time mom. She's a lawyer on parental leave. Her husband is a professor who often works from home. Yeah, I think, I think some people will be able to manage it, um, but of course there, there's just limitations, there's financial limitations. While the government expects 20,000 parents to use the longer leave option, some advocates say lower-income families will not benefit from the program's expansion. But it's about one-third of families who, in the current system, say that they have a hard time making ends meet. Will they actually be able to exercise that choice to spread their benefit out over 18 months? Small business owners are raising concerns, too, about the cost of training and finding staff to fill positions for longer amounts of time. <gasps> but for Halle, more time with her child is priceless. Any child can benefit from parents, uh, like, full-time attention for even longer. She and her husband plan to use the extension next time around. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. It does appear longer parental leaves lead to lifelong benefits. According to Save the Children, children who live in countries with longer periods of parental leave are breastfed longer and have higher life expectancy. So how does Canada compare to the rest of the world? At the top end, Sweden offers 68 weeks of parental leave. That's about 16 months, most of it at 80% pay. In Denmark and Norway, it's one year but with 100% pay. On the other end of the spectrum, the United States, maternity leave just 12 weeks tops, no wages paid. That is in line with countries like Swaziland, Lesotho, and Papua New Guinea. Hey, take a look at who's here tonight. The At Issue panel is back and they have a lot to talk about. From offshore tax havens to a year of Donald Trump in the White House. They'll break down what it means for the Prime Minister. Go deeper on the stories of the day earlier in the day. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash The National. The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon.
uh, in regards to the uh, specific case you mentioned, um, we uh, received uh, assurances, the same assurances that are in uh, the public uh, declaration uh, made in this case, uh, and uh, we are satisfied with that. That was Justin Trudeau in Vietnam on Wednesday defending his association with Stephen Bronfman, a major Liberal Party fundraiser. The guy, actually. Bronfman was named in the Paradise Papers as having ties to an offshore trust worth millions in the Cayman Islands. First, Bill Morneau, now Stephen Bronfman. Stu Trudeau's been spending a lot of time lately defending multimillionaires. At issue is here to talk about that. And more for the first time in a long while. They're really here at the table in Toronto, and I get to join them, which is a thrill. Uh, Andrew, Chantal, and joining us for the first time tonight, initiating it with me, uh, Josh Wingrove of Bloomberg. Good to see you all. Thanks, Rosie. And th welcome to the nice big studio. Yeah, it's nice. Um, Andrew, let's start with you. Do you think that this is something that uh, affects the Liberal Party writ large? Do you think it affects Justin Trudeau's branding? Uh, a bit of both, and it's uh, it's comp compounding on top of a bunch of other things, on top of Bill Morneau's troubles, on top of the broader issue of numbered companies, on top of the cash for access fundraisers with the Chinese billionaires, on top of the Christmas of the Aga Khan. Um, this whole thing is so toxic for them because if you go back to Justin Trudeau's original premise, mm -hmm. that whole we're fighting for the middle class yeah. was partly a shield. It was to protect him against the accusation that he was some out of touch entitled little trust fund kid. And if that gets broken down, as I think it has broken down a lot, um, then he's vulnerable. It, 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 it's not fair, it's not right, perhaps, it's cheap, but it's the kind of politics that, that, uh, that can be damaged. But you can be rich and still defend the middle class, what, presumably. Yes, and others have in the past, so this isn't the first, uh, but the at some point, you also have to address the substance of the issue. Uh, and if there had not been this Morno fall, mm -hmm. uh, this story would not have very much legs. Uh, it kind of makes you thankful, looking at it, frankly. Uh, and Trudeau should be thankful that we have changed the political financing of parties. So that yeah. what this mostly illustrates is when big money was in the financing of parties, you could actually blackmail a prime minister into doing things that your friends who were also deep pocket uh, donors uh, right. wanted. Right. In this day and age, uh, to call Stephen Bronfman the bagman for the Liberal Party is kind of a caricature in the sense that even if he brings all of his friends to one evening to meet Justin Trudeau and give money, they'll all still only give $1,500 yeah. that year and they'll have to do it the next year. There's no real so, bag of money anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so up to a point, it does illustrate why it was essential to change those rules and how that changed the game rather significantly for people with deep pockets. So, but what about the issue of, of tax reform? I mean, that's because that's where this, and you're right, I think you're all right. If it hadn't been the Morno thing, I'm not sure that this would have picked up as much traction. So do, have they lost credibility on the issue of trying to reform taxes at all? Well, I think the question is, in many ways, how does Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, respond, and how does Justin Trudeau, the liberal leader, respond? I mean, sure. you saw him there. You know, the question is, hey, this is your chief fundraiser. What are you going to do about it? And the answer is nothing. And I think uh, Chantel has illustrated some of the reasons why. A lot of the people caught up in this. Wilbur Ross comes to mind, the U.S. Commerce Secretary. I think have a lot more pressing questions in front of them now than Stephen Bronfman does. A lot of the revelations in Canada were more jaw-dropping for the Colbert angle. Yep. You know, politicians, frankly, have sort of come and gone from yep. the Ottawa yep. scene. So the question is, what does Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, do? And as I think we've seen from the last four months, this government doesn't have the stomach for another tax fight. And so they're committing money to the CRA even though some of their own senators, Percy Downs, says it's sort of a, a ruse uh, the, to, to go after tax sheets, go after offshore. Yeah. But beyond that, I don't think we're going to see them take a lot of action. But that's the thing, is it feeds into this narrative, if you will, that you're going after the doctors and the lawyers and the farmers, uh, but meanwhile you're leaving the offshore trusts. Except you're not going anymore after you've <laughs> no. given a gift to well, the doctors right. and the lawyers right. and the but farmers. It, but if you're talking about sort of the political judgment involved, it is remarkable, I, to, I would say, that they set off on this track in, back in July, and it doesn't seem to have occur, occurred to anybody when they were going after these private corporations. Say, do you think anyone yeah. will mention our own private corporations? Yeah. Again, it's ad hominem, but if you're asking to be congratulated for your commitment to fairness and justice, it, it does great on people. This is a government also that taxes income. They don't tax well. They back down from taxing cap, the capital gains stuff. That's right. They have not moved, or sorry, I should say the stock option stuff. Stock they options, haven't yeah. moved on capital gains. You know, the, the, there's a good argument to me, and I think the reason why there's 
traction to the doctors and lawyers is that this is a government going after more of the upper middle class than the truly rich. It, it, that sort of leads me to the next part of what I want to talk about, and that is, um, you know, if you go back to the way this the tax reform thing was announced back in the summer, and then the way it all unfolded, there are people now inside the government who are saying, are we making these mistakes because we are so focused on Donald Trump and NAFTA? Um, so it's one year since the election. It's one year since they put that war room in place. They're spending a lot of effort and energy and resources doing that. Are they doing that to the detriment of other things, Chantal? Of course they are. In the same way that uh, the Quebec referendum changed uh, the rest of uh, Jean Chrétien's first mandate, it was not their plan to suddenly have to deploy all their resources yeah. on the unity front, and a lot of other things fell by the wayside. And the night of the American election, Justin Trudeau's agenda was hijacked. Things that were not even in the pile became to do things at the top uh, of the list. Yeah. And it's an ongoing process. It's not a crisis you can resolve and then you can move on. This is going to be overshadowing the rest of the mandate. Uh, and it's the number one file, but while the political energy is focused on that, and a lot of people think that they've done well on, on yes, so yeah, far on that yeah. file, they, it's a centralized government, no less centralized than all the previous ones, a lot of other things, and a rookie government with rookie ministers, including at finance, so uh, who can't take care of themselves without supervision. And, and it's a government if I may say, with some people at the top who are very pleased with themselves. I think that's true in any political party press, but I think a lot of people would say there's a certain overconfidence. They had a great run for the, for the first couple of years. And without taking away from the point, yes, Donald Trump was this huge yeah. distraction, but I think you can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I'm not sure I could, we, we could lay this, uh, this problem of, of how they pitched the tax reform to that. I think it's more they just didn't see it coming and they maybe were just a little too overconfident about it. And flat-footed, they didn't respond quickly when it started brewing. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying the president is the reason for yeah. their no, mistakes, for sure. certainly, but it, would it help if they were able to sort of not spend so much time on that, given that we don't really have evidence, and you and I were talking about this, that, that it's paying off? Um, would it be better if they sort of refocused domestically, I guess? Well, I think that they have a bandwidth issue. They haven't been particularly good at passing legislation. They haven't been particularly good at managing the House uh, broadly, but, uh, you know, Trump is hanging over them whether they like it or not. I'm not sure we uh, sort of rehashing and relitigating it is going to, you know, get them anywhere. I think that they are going to find themselves, and we saw this in the last round in D.C., even, you know, in this for months and months and months. Last round of negotiations. Round of right yeah, yeah. And, after, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. ultimately, this is how you judge governments, is how do they react to events they didn't foresee, that for weren't sure. in their yes. mandate. For sure. Brian Mulroney didn't run on free trade, but when it became clear that he had to do it, he did it. Jean Cartier ran against, we didn't have to deal with the deficit, but when it was clear he had to, he dealt with it. So that is one of the, the measures of a government is when, when this big thing is thrown at you, how well do you scramble, how well do you adjust But the, the lesson from that, to, to kind of flip this discussion, uh, is that Brian Mulroney had hosts of problems. He was losing ministers. He was yeah. having trouble managing files. He, he was failing to control public spending. But he got re-elected with a majority on free trade because in the end, and that's part of the calculation, uh, you get judged on the bigger things. Yeah. And the question, one of the ballot box questions, is going to be, do you want Justin Trudeau to be sitting across from Donald Trump, yeah. or would you rather have Andrew Scheer or Jack Mead Singh? Answer the question, go vote. Assuming Trump is still there in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> He's outlasted yes. longer than we yeah. thought, yeah. so our well, last it's that. less than a year. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that that is true. I think the liberals have put clearly some of their best ministers on this. We're going we're gonna to be in this for a while. But, you know, we go back to the, the root question of what impact will these Paradise Papers have too, you know? And, and I think to a certain extent the Trump, Trudeau, Paradise Papers are, are all connected. It's to the extent yeah. that they get to a straw that breaks the camel's back and liberals are seen as, you know, insular, arrogant, you know, disconnected from the average Canadian. And I think all these files have a risk to blow up for them as always. You know, what will be the straw that broke the camel's back? This camel already has but, I don't know, Aga Khan and Bill Mulroney Mordo riding on the back of it. That's right. Brian Mulroney once said during, when we asked him, don't you think you're hurting the Charlottetown Accord by being the main salesman? Sadly, he said, Mother Teresa was not available. When we go in the next election, Mother Teresa will not be on the ballot. This is true. You're no, but Justin Trudeau will, and his brand continues to hold, you know, yeah. in spite of all these things. Okay.
Andrew, Chantal, Josh, that was fun. Thank Let's you. do it again. <laughs> Thank you. Good news for all you people who love politics as much as I do. Canada's most watched political panel is also a podcast. If you want to hear Chantal, Andrew and others this week, Josh, be sure to subscribe. You'll get extra content and, of course, the main panel in that podcast form every week. So you can do it on the treadmill or whatever. Look, at, look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app or on our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Your favorite band is coming to town. You're ready to buy tickets the moment they go on sale, but before you can click purchase, ah, oh, they're already sold out. How are you getting hundreds of tickets in just a few minutes? The man who may be one of the world's biggest ticket resellers turns out he's Canadian. Next on The National. Anyone who thinks that a 50 or $100 ticket will actually cost them 50 or $100 is clearly a naive, a mark who needs to learn the rules of the game. Strictly speaking, scalping tickets above face value is illegal everywhere in Canada except BC. But about 100 scalpers busily ply their trade in Toronto without too much hassle from the law, as long as they're not too brazen about it. So it's like one big open-air bazaar out there before game time with scalpers buying from season ticket holders who can't use their tickets and selling for whatever they think they can get. And one veteran scalper, Glenn, no last names please, says he still gets a kick out of the cut and thrust of the marketplace. I love it. It's more of a, it's a rush. It's an adrenaline rush. What's the adrenaline rush of scalping? Explain this to me. It's fun. It's fun taking money from people. You don't understand that. It's just, it's, it's a rush. It's like a gambler. If you see a gambler at a racetrack, it's like you're cashing in. It's not, not a low level bother for us. It's, it is, it's a major customer service issue. You'd think scalpers would be just a minor league irritation to Ticketmaster's Tom Worrell. Hi, this is Ticketmaster. My name is Joseph. How can I help you? Ticketmaster provides box office service to just about every major venue in Canada, usually charging six or seven dollars above the face price. And it's constantly jousting with scalpers and ticket brokers to keep the best seats from their clutches. We see disappointment from fans not getting access to tickets, not being able to buy tickets. Um, we put in many different types of controls to make sure that tickets are distributed in a fair and equitable manner, that seats get into the hands of, of, uh, most of, the, into the, hands of most of the customers. Um, scalpers, of course, are on the opposite end and they're always trying to buy up as much inventory as they can. Um, I can give you some examples. Um, outlets, for instance, um, the scalpers will hire homeless people, they'll go to the halfway houses, um, they'll rent buses, and stack the lines at our outlets. Why don't you get into an, a legal line of work? Uh, it's illegal, but it's a, it's a bylaw, right? It's, it's a technical thing, right? I don't see anything wrong with what I do. I'm providing a service. If I buy a stock for $5 and sell it two days later for 10 bucks, and I do that with a million shares, I'm a genius. If I buy 100 tickets and charge $10 more than what they're worth two days later, I'm a crook but so low level that most cops can't be bothered nailing them. The fine's rarely more than $100 and it's often hard to prove in court. Besides, scalpers will often sell below face price to some events, still making money because they bought way below face price. At Blue Jay Games nowadays, you can often do better with scalpers than at the box office. As long as scalpers behave civilly, not always a given, cops will look the other way, except for one who has made scalpers his special mission. How long have you been uh, chasing after scalpers? I've been charging them since approximately 1990. Lauren Bass knows he won't wipe them out, but that doesn't mean he has to abide their snubbing of the bylaw. The law is the law, no matter how inconsequential. Tickets for Adele's most recent concert went on sale here in Vancouver. They sold out in minutes, only to show up online a short time later, but for a lot more money. 
It's something a lot of music and sports fans face these days, and turns out a massive leak of financial records is showing us why. Tonight, from the Paradise Papers, we're getting an exclusive look at one of the world's biggest ticket scalpers. He's running a multinational operation, moving millions of dollars in tickets each year, and we've discovered he's Canadian. Take a look at what the CBC's Dave Seglins and the Fifth Estate have dug up about the incredibly lucrative world of super scalpers. I am, of course, coming on tour, and I can't wait to see all of you there. So see you all very, very soon. Oh my God, we're trying to buy Adele tickets and I'm so stressed out. When pop star Adele went on world tour last year, fans were over the moon, at least the ones who could get tickets. So we have four computers going, trying to get tickets to see Adele. Chris is in, oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> we're going to Adele. Please give me these. Your order's complete! Your order's complete! Your order's complete! Yes! Tickets sold out in minutes, one of the biggest, fastest sellouts in history. Scalpers attack the online ticketing systems. Despite a limit of four per fan, our investigation found that one buyer made purchase after purchase, scooping up hundreds of tickets in just minutes. That scalper was Julian Lavallee, 30 years old. He lives here in this million-dollar home in Boucherville, Quebec. CBC and Toronto Star discovered his business records in the Paradise Papers. Two years ago, he set up a company, I Want Ticket. It was in the offshore tax haven of Isle of Man. He filed papers revealing a growing multinational scalping operation. 2014, 7.9 million in sales in Canada and the US, with expansion plans targeting the UK in what he called a partnership with StubHub, a huge eBay company. Sometimes, no matter how much they're looking forward to the gig, some fans are unable to use their tickets. No. Buy and sell your gig tickets safely and securely at stubhub.co.uk. StubHub promotes itself as a website for regular fans to offload tickets when you get sick or can't make it to a show. You can buy their tickets. StubHub, the way ticket buying should be. But we found there's way more to it. StubHub runs a little known program for what it calls its top sellers, people with thousands of tickets to sell. And StubHub offers financial incentives for sellers moving half a million, a million, up to $5 million worth a year. And in the UK, Canadian super scalper Julian Lavallee has been moving tons of tickets on StubHub. We found him buying up seats for Metallica, $21,000 worth. Ed Sheeran, $25,000. Canadian superstar Drake went on sale, Lavallee dropped another 20,000 on 102 tickets. Presumably all to be marked up and resold on StubHub. We went looking for Lavallee. Monsieur Lavallee, bonjour. On est journaliste de Radio-Canada, CBC, puis du Toronto Star. We found him back in Canada at an office in suburban Montreal, but he wouldn't answer our questions. Mr. Lavallee, how are you getting so many tickets in so few so few minutes? How are you getting hundreds of tickets in just a few minutes? You got our email. You Sorry? Go, you, you got our email. You can go through our process to get our information. What is your relationship with StubHub? How much money are you making, Mr. Lavallee? How much money are you making off the tickets? And Dave Seglins joins us now. Uh, Dave, I guess the first question is, is what he's doing legal? Well, great question. We got an email from his lawyer who says Lavallee's Quebec-based operation is run in accordance with the laws and the regulations uh, in all the jurisdictions he's operating um, and selling. Keep in mind, he's in Quebec, but a lot of what we found was buying and selling activity over the internet uh, happening in the UK. R right, so, so what are the laws then around scalping? Well, ironically, Quebec is one of the few provinces that has an explicit anti-scalping law, but it's largely aimed at consumer protection in Quebec. It's not clear it would reach overseas. Uh, in the UK, on the other hand, there are laws against misuse of computers or misrepresenting yourself using multiple identities to, uh, to buy tickets. But this is where our fifth estate investigation took us, to the UK, we have learned that there are two investigations going on involving StubHub. They catch uh, Julian Lavallee, um, and we've got some really interesting video that uh, on our hunt for Lavallee into his global empire, and we'll be airing that tomorrow night on the Fifth Estate. Hmm. So uh, all, all of this does stem from the Paradise Papers. What's coming down the pipe in that regard? 
Well, Paradise Papers is 13 million records, and we have all of this stuff from offshore law firms and 19 separate tax haven corporate registries. The International Association, or the International Consortium, sorry, of Inter Investigative Journalists are putting all of that online next week. So as of next Tuesday, November 14th, the Paradise Papers will be public and available not just to people who are curious, but tax authorities and police around the world whose job it is to look for tax evasion, money laundering, tax avoidance. And keep in mind, when the Panama Papers came out, uh, in the wake of that, the Canada Revenue Agency uh, has told us they have launched 123 audits and several criminal investigations. So this new leak being put online is certainly going to be of great interest to law enforcement and tax authorities around the globe. We'll be watching. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. We'll get the real story from CBC News journalists all day long. Find powerful images on Instagram, exclusive video on Facebook, tweet us at CBC The National, and follow along with the conversation tonight with our hashtag CBC The National. Federal election night. This is Studio 7 in Toronto, and watching our observers from the major television networks, because for the first time anywhere in the world, the TV viewer sitting at home will be the first person to know the results of the voting. Until now, when the voting results came in, they were compiled by the computer and the results passed on to an operator who turned dials or wrote figures on a board. The TV cameras had to roam from one results board to another. But here there is only one results board. As fast as the computer compiles the results, they are shown on this screen automatically, always changing to keep pace with the latest figures. This machine, DivCon, developed by RCA Victor engineers in Montreal, takes the results straight from the memory of the computer and shows the figures electronically on a television screen. There isn't a fraction of a second lost. It is the first instantaneous election coverage on television. Another first. The CBC and its affiliated stations gather their own results from every riding in Canada with the speed needed by radio and television. 18 teletype circuits are added to the normal three circuits used for transmitting election results, guaranteeing that the CBC English and French networks are first with the results. The anchormen at Election Central are Knowlton Nash and the Dean of Broadcasters on Parliament Hill, Norman DePoe. To back up their reports and comments, CBC Television can switch in a second for live reports from Vancouver, Ottawa, Red Deer, Rouen, or St. John's. Every 20 minutes, each television station along the network takes 10 minutes to report in detail on the election results for its own area. Results from the polls are gathered at the local stations and sent by teletype to Election Central. Local experts report the results, comment on election trends, and interview the candidates. On the National tonight, a police procession to honor a fallen officer. People, including first responders, lined overpasses and roads from Vancouver to Abbotsford to pay their respects to Constable John Davidson. His motorcade was making its way to a funeral home. Davidson was a police veteran of 24 years, killed Monday in a shootout with a suspect. The funeral will be held on November 19th. Also tonight, the family of Roy Halliday sharing their grief over his death. It was back on Tuesday. The former star pitcher was killed when his plane crashed off the coast of Florida. Here's part of the statement his family issued today. We remember him as an amazing father, loving husband, and loyal friend. 
We hope that he serves as an example of professionalism, integrity, and hard work for all who knew him. Okay, let's bring you back up to speed on another big story. The allegations of sexual misconduct against comedian Louis C.K. Now, here on the program, we've talked about how those claims come from five women, published in the New York Times today. Some of those women say he masturbated in front of them. Now, at this hour, we're still waiting for Louis C.K. to respond, but there have already been major consequences. HBO put out a statement saying he's no longer going to be part of their comedy benefit set for next week. They're also pulling all of Louis C.K.'s content from their on-demand services. Now, to be clear, these are allegations at this point, but that suddenly the comedy world has found itself the focus of all of this comes as no surprise to our next guest, Rebecca Kohler, joining us right now. She's a comedian, 17 years in the business, joining us right now out of Los Angeles. And Rebecca, you weren't surprised. Can you tell us why? No, I wasn't surprised. Um, number one, just in terms of the fact that in the comedy community, rumors about Louis C.K. have been running around for, you know, at least five years ago, I probably heard the first rumor. So as a comedian who heard the rumors, I was not surprised. But I also just wasn't surprised as a woman who's been in the comedy industry for 17 years, experienced my own forms of harassment, and, um, and just a woman who lives in the world. Uh, this... Anyone who finds this really surprising, I feel like they might be a bit of an ostrich. And, and, and can you just help me understand, I mean, what, what is the kind of sexual harassment that you would see in the comedy world or at a comedy club that, that you might not necessarily see elsewhere or in other industries? Well, um, the comedy uh, climate is kind of an odd one in that, you know, think about it, you're in a comedy club... 90% um, of the time that you're working, a comedy club is essentially a bar. People are drinking. You're having fun. Um, and also, you're all comedians. And so, um, if somebody does something that might be in a, that would be inappropriate in an office setting, uh, the rules are looser and there's more of a gray area. Um, but, like, things that I've witnessed personally just in a comedy club are things like dry humping, um, lewd sexual gestures that would get you fired from any office job. Um, and also just things that have been said to me, uh, you know, like I remember asking a comedian for a, a ride to a gig once, which is standard practice in, in the comedy world, and he responded by saying maybe I could offer him a blowjob to make giving me the ride worth it. Um, which, again, I, I think in any other, you know, go to HR at any office, that, that'll get you fired. And, and so, are, I mean, what are those comedians telling you then after the fact? I mean, that, that it was all just a joke? They just expect you to have a, a thicker skin? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Most of the time, I didn't really question it because this is part of the culture, and this is probably why Louis C.K., I mean, a lot of the allegations in the article are, are pretty old um, because this has been going on since the beginning of time slash the beginning of comedy. And so, and most of these women didn't want to come forward because it goes against the culture. Um, if I had come forward and complained about these people, I would just, people would say, oh, who wants to work with her? She's a buzzkill. Hmm. Rebecca Kohler, uh, very nice to hear your, your points of view on this. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for talking about this. And so, Ian, the, uh, the tidal wave roars on. I mean, it's staggering. The, the, the list of names uh, of people who've been swept up in allegations just getting longer and longer and longer. And, and the, the action, the reaction, the consequences just happen like that, right? An announcement's yeah. made, an article is published, and the next moment uh, there is a reaction. So, uh, boy, this story is moving very quickly. I'll be live in Ottawa, by the way, tomorrow night as we get ready for Remembrance Day on Saturday. Right now, though, we want to introduce you to two Canadian veterans from two generations. Lieutenant David Howard is 99 years old. He served in the Second World War. Lieutenant Jennifer Martin serves in the Canadian Navy. Our colleagues at CBC Toronto brought them together ahead of Remembrance Day, and that is our moment of the day. I remember thinking as a school kid, wow, you know, this is an important day, but I didn't have a connection to it. But I somehow always looked up to people like you and thought, how on you earth? Don't. No, we're just plain old people. You're not. Yeah. <laughs> it was relatively peaceful in the Navy when I joined it. It wasn't that way for you. And I think that I often wonder, could I have joined in the same scenario? I don't know. Yes, you would. You would have Maybe. been there in a second. Do you not think of yourself as a hero? No, I don't. Not really. I'm one of 
thousands of others. You seem very <laughs> adamant not were. to be a hero. Eh? You seem very adamant. Of course I'm not. I'm just an ordinary guy who was there. Who went to, we did a job, had made great friends. I hope the next one is very short and doesn't seduce people in the same way. Do you think there'll be a next one? Uh, who knows? Who knows? <clears throat> Life isn't uh, exactly peaceful right now. Boy, the insight of a lot of ordinary guys put into an extraordinary circumstance, what Tom Brokaw described as the greatest generation, Andrew. Yeah, no, no kidding. Let me just say, I could listen to that conversation for hours. I wish that, that it actually kept going. And uh, um, on a future note, so we were talking about Saturday just a moment ago. Uh, we've all heard of Twitter takeover. So this is really neat. The CBC News Twitter account is going to be taken over by a veteran, a woman by the name of Natasha Dupuis on Saturday. She's got, uh, she was with the Canadian Forces for 16 years. She's going to be tweeting her perspectives, her thoughts. Uh, that's uh, Remembrance Day morning. And we're both going to be in Ottawa um, for the Remembrance Day special. And the one thing that always strikes me about that day is that those guys, those veterans of World War II, which of course there are increasingly few of, uh, are so humble and, and always wary to take the compliments. I have been at Remembrance Day ceremonies in Vancouver many times, in Sackville, New Brunswick, but never Ottawa, and very much looking forward to it on Saturday. Well, thank you very much for watching. That's The National for November the 8th. Good night. Good night.